I think you can start now if you haven't already. Start it. Okay. Yeah, so today we are going to talk about smart pointers in Rust, and these are pointers with a really high IQ. But they don't. Um, yeah, so we will look at just a quick recap of pointers in general. Uh, that's a bit more related to maybe C and where you touch pointers more directly. Uh, what is it that makes a pointer smart? Um, like how intelligent are they really? Uh, we're going to look at uh, the box type and the RC type that exists in Rust. And a bit about maybe in the end, some questions you should ask yourself before starting to use smart pointers before, like, what should you think about? Like, is it the correct solution for my problem? Uh, because oftentimes they may not be actually. So, um, so let me just pop the chat over. Here. Okay. Uh, so before we start, let's just do a quick general high level overview of pointers. Uh, any questions can, of course, be asked in chat or uh, on voice at any given time if you have anything or if something is not clear. So basically, it's just points to a place in memory. That's it. It's uh, base, It's just a number, usually, that uh, indicates an offset into the memory where you find something. Something. Um, that can be an integer, it can be a dog, it can be a, a vector, like a list of data, it can be basically anything. And it's just uh, like an address, uh, but the address is just a number. Uh, pointers are usually aligned to some byte boundary, depending on what it points to and the operating system. So on a 32-bit operating system, for example, uh, a pointer will be uh, four bytes in size. Uh, as that's uh, that's you can you can't address more memory than that, and on a sixty four bit system they will be eight bytes in size and uh, can always uh, uh, can uh, address a lot more memory. So this is why your old computers would only be able to address about half four gigabytes of memory, and apart from that they wouldn't be able to do much. Um, some things can be aligned on even addresses, that's a lot more common than odd, from what I know. Um, and integers, for example, can be will can be aligned on some number. So if an integer is four bytes, then usually they will be aligned on four byte addresses. So only addresses that end with, given that addresses are numbers, they will only be located on addresses that end with 0, 4, 8, uh, 12, or 16. Uh, but that's not, uh, uh, that's just a bit of theory. Uh, and as I said, they have a fixed size depending on the how your operating system. So you, if it's a 64 bit, it's just an 8 bit, 8 byte pointer. And same with the other types of operating systems. Uh, they're technically a very dumb data type because all they do is they have a number. And if you go to that place in memory, you find something. Um, in C, at least, it doesn't have to even have to know what it points to uh, with the concept of a void pointer. Um, it, it's up to the language really to determine and or whether it's strongly typed or not to figure out what's at this address or the programmer should know. If, you, if, the, if the, your compiler doesn't know, then at least you should know. <laughs> Otherwise, there's no really much point in using pointers. Uh, but it's very useful because you can refer to anything. So you can refer to a huge data set of many gigabytes with something that has a constant size of, for example, just four or eight bytes. So, and also the memory that it points to uh, can usually uh, has a different lifetime than the pointer itself. So a pointer can, uh, uh, can exist well, usually you don't want it to exist longer than what you're pointing to, but uh, and also 
but the shorter can happen if you have, for example, multiple pointers to it. So. But the core essence to take out of this is that it's a dumb data type that basically just refers to something in memory and it doesn't have to know what it is, like in general. Uh, in Rust, you don't really touch pointers directly. It's more uh, called references and everything is strongly typed. So, uh, so pointing to nothing or things you don't know what is, is generally, at least in my experience, not something you do very often. Uh, so what, what makes a pointer smart in comparison? Um, the concept of a smart pointer was first introduced in C++ uh, about uh, maybe around 10, 10 to 15 years ago today. Um, and basically they have a way of uh, declaring ownership of the data that they point to. Uh, but not all, only that, uh, it's also important that they clean up after themselves. So uh, basically the data you own will also be cleaned up automatically. So like regular pointers have a lot of uh, issues. So uh, I didn't discuss them on the previous slide, but uh, yeah, that's uh, what's gonna come on the next one. So, uh, and before using them, which, uh, we need to think about the problem, which we will get back to. And otherwise you just end up with the issues of dumb pointers and then smart pointer issues on top of that. So, uh, yeah. And then let's just look at, so these are the common, some common pitfalls with regular pointers. Uh, if you have the dynamically allocated memory, you can end up freeing it twice. Like all of these problems are more, a lot more, uh, prevalent in uh, other system languages like C or C++. Uh, but it's important to know what problems you're trying to solve with smart pointers in Rust 2, even if um, you don't really get to touch this as directly because the borrow checker and all of the other tools uh, in Rust prevent you from doing this a lot of the time. But it's still important to know that double free. So if you're allocating memory and trying to free the memory twice, um that's uh, that's that's a crash can be can be anything uh, dangling pointers so you point to a value that no longer exists or null pointers the pointer doesn't point to anything or maybe it never pointed to anything at all and you're trying to uh, move through the pointer so smart pointers want to solve these problems in one way or another uh, so what they will do is they will manage the lifetime of the pointed to objects. So this is only relevant usually for uh, when you need to all allocate memory dynamically. If you don't do that, then, uh, then the lifetime is managed by whatever object owns, uh, owns it on the stack. If you don't allocate on the heap, then it's, the lifetime is sort of already managed. Uh, but on the heap, then you need to actually allocate and free it. And it adds basically that level of safety on top of the raw pointers, uh, which uh, prevents you, at least in the, an ideal case, it prevents you, at least makes it harder to <laughs> encounter any of these issues. Like as a programmer, you obviously have the final say, so you can force things like this to happen if you really want to. But uh, then, yeah, you don't want that. Uh, of course, they can introduce their own set of problems, like you can actually still force these things. And uh, sometimes <clears throat> using them to avoid a compiler error, because you don't know how to solve the compiler error and the smart pointer somehow fixes it, is not going to be like the best way always, because you don't know, then you don't know what problem you're actually solving. Uh, but uh, smart pointers, depending on which type you use, you can have things like reference counting and other types of abstractions over the underlying data. Uh, and that's very, which are very useful. So, so they're definitely a good thing, but uh, they should be thought, you should think about when to use them. So in, uh, in C++, there uh, we have something called a unique pointer, which is this more or less the same as a box in Rust that we're gonna look at today. And you also have a shared pointer, which is RC and Rust, and you can guess where that comes from. That's reference counting. And you have the concept of a weak pointer, which is used 
<clears throat> both in C++ and Rust when it uh, with together with the shared and the reference counted pointer. Um, in fact, uh, if you think about what they do, uh, Rust also says that um, strings and vectors are also in a way smart pointers because they manage the lifetime of uh, a collection of objects automatically. The data is automatically freed. You don't get the double free. It, the memory is always automatically expanded when you add objects to the vector or the string. Um, you don't get the dangling string or dangling vector because it always manages and it's, they are usually <coughs> a move only types so you, unless you clone them. And they are can't be null uh, as you don't have the concept of, a, of null really. So in a way they manage memory and do things like uh, like a smart pointer. So uh, so in a way you can call the string and the vector also a type of smart pointer. Uh, let's start looking at the simplest type. Uh, it's just a box. It's called a box, and it can hold any type. Uh, this will allocate a type T on the heap when you create it. And it represents ownership of the heap memory that holds this T. So underlying this owns the memory that holds the T and it allows you to access the T through the interface of the box. Uh, there's no performance overhead with using a box except the indirection you need to do when accessing it. So let's look at that. Uh, let's go to the code. So if you have an integer five and you want to print, print it, uh, the value is right there on stack memory and you just it just gets printed right away because you know exactly where it is and it's very local. Uh, then we can have an integer, another integer. So now we're going to create a box. Let's make it six so we can tell the difference. So this uh, has a little bit of overhead when you create a new one, since it has to allocate memory, uh, enough memory for to hold the integer. And then if we want to print it, and we look at that, uh, when you print this, it doesn't just print the value that's right there. It has to go into the box and follow the pointer to the memory where this value is stored, and then it can print it. So accessing data and through a box is a little bit slower than uh, than doing it on the stack. Uh, but uh, unless it's in a performance critical part of your code, it's generally going to be OK. But if it's in like a tight loop and you have a loop with many boxes that you have to iterate through, they don't have to be coherent in memory. So that can be something to consider. So. Uh, and they're good. Boxes are good when you want to hide big objects in a place of memory. So you can avoid big copies when interacting through the box. So if we had an object as a struct, we're going to have a big boy. Big person. Uh, we can have, for example, a string. Uh, if you have an object like this, this can have this can or something even bigger, like an, you can have some data point that is type uh, this by thirty two. Yeah, so it holds 6,700 integers on the stack and a lot of strings. This object can be pretty expensive to if you want to create one of these objects and you want to move them around. Uh, this that's going to be able to actually strings can't be copied. So let's just say it's like this. Now it has. Uh, now it has a lot of uh, it basically have over. 13,000 floats and integers. So, uh, and that takes up a lot of space. So, if we create this struct and let's move it around uh, with by copying it, 
that's going to take a lot of time to copy all of the data. So what you could do instead is if you create a box containing the big person. Now I have to, yeah, that's, that's actually not instantiated. The example is important. We have to progress. Uh, but you get the idea that uh, if an object is really huge, uh, if you point to it through a box, then all you have to copy is the box and the box as we said works a bit like a pointer so it only is four or eight bytes depending on your os so so then you can move it really quickly and the huge object stays in the same place in memory so you don't have to move it uh, another case is when you store trait objects which we will discuss on the next slide as an example or if you don't know the size of something at compile time which basically means Rust can't figure out the size of something. So when you allocate in the stack, all of those sizes are figured out during the compile stage because the compiler needs to know how much space to put on the stack every time. So, so uh, uh, that needs to be known. So this image is taken from the book uh, in the case uh, of the uh, last thing. Uh, since that's written there, I was, I'm going to focus on the an example for the second case. Uh, and if we have time, we can get back to some of the other cases. But uh, let's have a focus. Let's take a look at an example where you need a box when storing trait objects. Is the speed comfortable right now? Nice. Okay, so before we go to the example, let's just have a look at what a trait object is. So a trait object is any object that implements some trait T, but we don't care about the exact type uh, of T. So we don't care about the type of the object, but we care that it implements a trait. So we care about the methods that are available on the type. For example, if you have a, a game with many game objects, you can say all of them can say something, but depending on the type, whether it's a dog or a cat, they will say different things. Uh, it adds some overhead, like uh, with the, in addition to the regular uh, box overhead. Since uh, when calling methods through this, uh, there will be something called dynamic dispatch at the time of the method calls. In addition to the in indirection of accessing through a box that we just discussed. Uh, and basically what this means, um, or I will actually show it in the code afterwards. So, uh, and we will discuss the rest of this after the example. So, so let's go and just have a quick look at dynamic dispatch. So let's create ourselves a struct. Just call it uh, a dog. And then let's implement dog and create a function bark takes woof woof. Should not make it pop. So that's it. If we create a dog here, We don't even need to create it. We can just go dog bark. Uh, when we call this method, uh, Rust at compile time knows exactly where this method is because we know that the type is dog and the function is bark. And we know exactly where it is and how to call it. The compiler knows this right away. So that's static dispatch. Um, if, however, we have uh, another uh, let's object, let's get into the other example with the trait object. So let's create a trait that is audio source, for example. And this trait implements, has a method that's called emit. It takes self immutably and say some volume. And then instead of create implementing dog, 
we will uh, implement audio source for dog. Uh, and then if you're a dog, you will say something like, I'm a dog, woof, woof. Something like this. Mm. And then let's create another animal, or it doesn't even have to be an animal. It's an audio source, so this can be a footstep. And it says, uh, tap, tap, tap. Uh, so now we have two types, two structs that both implement uh, the audio source. Um, so say we wanted to have a audio sources vector uh, equals a vector of audio sources like so. So we want this vector to contain any type of audio source. And then we want it to make it mutable so we can add elements. And we want to push a dog to this. And we want to push a, a footstep to this. So basically we want the container can hold not just one type, we want it to be able to hold dogs, footsteps and any other type of audio source. Uh, by accessing them through the trait. Uh, but if we build now, uh, we get an error. Uh, and that's because uh, vectors requires that the element that it holds, uh, that you need a size that can be known at compile time. You do not know the size of an audio source at compile time. Uh, and the reason for that is that this is just a trait. A dog can implement this trait and it can have an age I32. Uh, let's say the dog is now four bytes. You can have a footstep that has maybe a loudness, uh, a surface ID and something else. Uh, this guy is now 16 bytes. So for a vector to be able to hold an audio source, it, they can, there are no different sizes uh, and the compiler cannot know this. So basically um, uh, this is not gonna work since the vector needs to hold a, an object of the same type of the same of a fixed size. Uh, it suggests adding dyne, which is not gonna do anything. It's the same thing. We still don't know the size of this. So, uh, so this is where boxes come in. Uh, a box has a fixed size and a box can hold an audio source uh, and you have to put dynamic in front to highlight that uh, calls to methods on this associated trait are dynamically dispatched um, and that's the next step so uh, since a box is a fixed size it's basically just a pointer so it holds it has a fixed size pointer to some of data type. This now holds a, the vector is now happy because it has fixed size objects. Uh, and the box is happy because uh, it only has to point to one type of audio source and that's a dynamic one. So it's allocated dynamically. Uh, that means it only holds something of the size of the object that it holds. So we can have the dog. We can create, now we have to create into a box. So we just go box new and then we put the type inside. Some fields are missing. Yeah, that's because I added age, but I don't care about the age. So. That was just to prove the other points. Uh, and then we have to do the same for the footstep by going box new footstep. Uh, and now we have a vector that holds both a dog and a footstep but through another level of indirection, which is the box. And now if we were to iterate through the vector, it 
source. Uh, we can take each source in the vector and call emit that, for example, volume 0 0.5. And then if we run the program, uh, we say, I'm a dog at 0.5, woof, woof, and we get top, 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 which is the footstep. So, and we can keep adding dogs and then a like, footstep again. And we can see that it still works. So now we have different types of storage. So this is, uh, in a way, uh, what basic polymorphism in other object-oriented languages sort of do, where you can have uh, interfaces and you have a vector, some collection of that type of interface and it just calls the methods on all of them. Like, uh, except here in Rust, it's called trait objects because it's based off of traits. Uh, so what happens here when we call source emit? This is where the dynamic dispatch happens. So the type of source when we iterate through is a reference to a box that holds a dynamic dispatch uh, audio source. So, so it's just a trait audio source. We know that this has the trait. So we can call any method on this source that the trait implements or, def or defines whatever. However, we don't know if this source is a dog. We don't know if it's a footstep. We don't know what type it is. We just know that it implements the trait. That's all we know. Uh, and since that's all we know, we can't just have the compiler put directly in the code which method to call because we don't know the type until runtime. Uh, and at that point, so what it has to do when it calls the emit function is it has to, uh, if you're familiar with how it works in C++, it's something called like a V table. Essentially what it is, it's, it's, it's like a table of functions. So you can say that you can have a dog emit and then some memory address. And you can have a footstep and then emit and then some other address. So what it has to do is it has to go through some table and look up dynamically, like okay, where is the uh, what what where uh, where is my emit method, which is the correct one, and then you have to call that on that correct type. So it's like a two-step process. So that adds a bit more overhead. So uh, with a vector of boxes that call methods, you have the overhead of the vector having um, a dynamic memory allocation somewhere. And then you have to, at that location, go through the uh, overhead of the box and to wherever that points, which could be somewhere totally different. And then you have to look up in the V table what method to call, and then you can call it. So, so clearly, like doing this is more expensive than just having a straight up vector of integers that you iterate through, because then you just go into the vector and all of the integers are neatly lined up right after each other so much faster uh, but what you do get is that flexibility over performance so sometimes you just you just need this this is this solves a problem where you need to have uh, multiple things happen and uh, at dynamically like this can be with, for example with drawing a ui you can have buttons you can have multiple types of uh, things that need to be drawn and you just want to loop through and call draw on everything. You don't want to have separate uh, containers for buttons, list and other things and have them uh, draw like that. But you can totally do that as well. Um, there's also one more limitation. You cannot return self from a trait object. So if we add it to this one, uh, make self if we did that uh, then this wouldn't work because uh, since you, you don't know the type of this so returning self makes no sense in this context because you don't know the type you just don't know it's an audio source if you return that dog here and hope to do something with the dog that doesn't work uh, the other restriction is that the trait cannot have a method with a generic type parameter. So you cannot have f and foo, for example, t, t, like so. 
uh, because um, as we just discussed with the V table, um, having a method foo on a generic type T means that in theory T can be any other type, which means you need a table that can in theory be of infinite size if you have every single type and the types just pile on. Uh, and also this function is all only instantiated for types T that are used in the code. So if you use it for anything else dynamically, then it's not going to, uh, it's not even going to be in that table. So those are the restrictions on the traits that you use. So for example, we couldn't have, a, have this be the clone trait, I think, or at least uh, not copy. I don't think it complains about it, but, but at least those are the restrictions on that. So uh, one more use case for this is if you have, for example, let uh, a game scene uh, be of type box to a dynamic. Let's just audio source for now. Uh, footstep. Uh, you can just, you don't have to use it through the vector. You can have a trait object that's just a box as well. So now the game scene is a footstep and you can go game scene.emit. And then later you can decide that this scene is now going to be a dog. If you would make it mutable first, of course. Um, and then if you run it, you now have a first footstep and then a dog. So if you had the reason I put games in here is because maybe this is a main menu, which has some logic. And then when the user clicks a button, they're going to change the scene to from a main menu to a platform scene or a character creation scene. And I just, you can have one type that is dynamic to some game state. And then you can just reassign it dynamically and then it's gonna start calling the methods of the other one. And that's gonna allow you to, it's, it's quite a powerful concept though, anyway. Uh, but at least it's good to know that you have this possibility. Uh, then we have the RC type, which is the reference counted type in Rust, uh, reference counted smart pointer. Uh, it allows for multiple ownership of the same data and that data will not be destroyed until all the owners have gone out of scope. Uh, RC is a single thread reference count, so you can't use this across threads. There's some other data types for that, which we will not look at today. And this can be used, for example, when you don't know who will be the last owner to access the resource. Um, because if you did know that, then maybe you would just make it a box or not use a smart pointer at all and just use stack memory. Uh, and since it's refer reference counted, that means every time you clone it, the reference count increases. And when it goes out of scope or when it drops, then it goes down. And when it reaches zero, the resource is freed. Um, there is a specific method called RC clone that you need to use to clone uh, any reference counted pointer, which will take care of all of that. And there's in relation to shared pointers or reference counted pointers, uh, there's usually a data type known as a weak pointer that lets you have references to the same data without participating in the reference count, determining when to drop the resource. Uh, so for example, if you have a tree structure where you have a pointer to the child and a pointer to the parent, if both of these took part in the reference count of each other, then at some point you might end up in a situation where neither one ever gets destroyed because since they refer each other, there will always be like that one reference count that remains. So uh, weak pointers allow you to have references to the same object that is a reference counted pointer point to, uh, but without 
affecting the reference count and then breaking these cyclic dependencies. So it's an important concept when you have uh, multiple elements. So let's quickly just show how to use this as a basic example. And then I think we have to go forwards a little bit and see just uh, what we have time for. So in theory, I, I guess I could just replace all of the box stuff with RC. And it should work the same, except all of these are now reference counted, which adds more overhead and more size to each pointer. But yes, you can just use it as a drop-in replacement. Of course, that wouldn't actually solve any problems and just create more overhead. So do think about what you need when you create the pointers as well. Uh, but just as a quick syntax breakdown, let's have our RST in, for example, just be a, a reference counted integer. That's at zero, and that starts at 10. Um, to create a RC in two, so to create a clone of this that will increment the count, we use RC clone and we take a reference to the pointer, reference count of pointer that we want to clone. And this will make sure that the reference count increases. If we did this again inside a scope, for example, And here we could use either int or int2 since they, base, they point to the same data. So it doesn't matter which one we increment. And let's try to visualize this by having RC Let's print out the number of references after each step. And just run it. So when we create it, the reference count is one. Then we create another uh, reference counted pointers that use share the same data, goes up to two. Then we create this scope uh, that creates another clone and prints out, which goes up to three. And then the, at the end of this scope, uh, this goes out of scope, which drops it or destructs it, whatever you prefer. Uh, which then takes the reference count back down to two. Since at this point, we have two variables that do so. And at the end of the function, uh, we reach the end. And then this goes out of scope, takes it down to one. This goes out of scope, takes it down to zero. And then the integer is finally freed. So only when all of the owners are freed uh, do we let go of the value. Uh, so we can also create weak pointers here if we don't want to participate in the those rules, then we could go ahead and create a week. And the way you do that is you called RC uh, downgrade. And then you pass in, for example, this one. So when you call downgrade, you get a weak pointer in return to an integer. Uh, this refers to the exactly the same value but you have to do an extra step to get access to it. So uh, regular access pattern is you just, okay, you can just print the RC int and you get your 10. Uh, and then we have a weak ref. If you try to print the weak, that's not gonna work. And that's because the weak pointer doesn't know if what it points to is still valid. Like it doesn't participate in the reference count. So this one doesn't know if, uh, has this gone out of scope? Has this been destroyed? Uh, does it still exist? It doesn't know that. Like it just knows that I, I refer to this thing and that may or may not be valid at any given point in the future. So to figure that out, uh, we have to upgrade this pointer. So if 
we call weak.upgrade. Uh, I don't know if you saw the return type there, but let's do it again. Uh, you'll see that this return an option to a reference counted a smart pointer that points to an integer. So when you upgrade this, if the original value still exists, then you get some option, like you get the enum value sum. So that means you have now upgraded this pointer to a regular reference count, which now participates. And for as long as that return value is alive, you can be sure that the value won't be deleted because you're now a part of the reference count. And then when this goes out of scope, it counts back down. So if we wanted to use this, let's say we wanted to use if let some valid value, we can go weak.upgrade. So in the case where this is valid, then we want to print the valid value. So inside of this scope right here, uh, the RST int cannot become invalid because you have upgraded this successfully and this value participates in the reference count. So as long as you're in here, let's just print the reference count in here as well. And right before, before and rest inside upgrade and then after upgrade. Uh, so here we create our weak pointer. We just print the regular value. And then we say the reference count before this, uh, this upgrade, inside the upgrade and after the upgrade. So what we see is the regular access pattern produces the value 10. The reference count before is two. And when we upgrade this successfully and it becomes valid, then the reference count increases to three because we have the this pointer is an actually fully reference counted one that participates. Uh, we can then access the value through this uh, valid pointer, which we know will be valid for as long as we have access to it. And after upgrade, uh, after the scope, this one is this valid value is destroyed, and it's uh, we're back to uh, back to two, which are the original two. So. That's very uh, useful in the cases where you have multiple multiple owners of the same memory, and or you want to have have that relationship, and you don't know which one will be the last owner. For example, if owners come into play, they do something, and then they go out, and some other owner may have come in to look at the data in the meantime. Uh, then it's nice to have this reference count to be able to. I have it removed in the end. So if you think about a garbage collected language, uh, most values there are implicitly reference counted because otherwise the garbage collector would know when, when to collect unused values. So you can think of uh, garbage collected values as always having <laughs> the reference count overhead, at least in, in most cases. Uh, so yeah, that's that. Uh, let's just have a quick five minute break before we go into the final part of today. So I'll see you back at 9.30.
Okay, I'm gonna wait 20 seconds to get everyone prepared for the final session. Okay, so just to wrap up uh, the discussion on the box and the reference counter types, uh, let's look at something that is quite relevant for smart pointers to uh, that allow them to work in general and concepts that are going to help you implement your own types of smart pointers if you ever want or need to do so. Uh, so the first is the concept of dereferencing which allows you to treat the smart pointer the same way as a regular pointer or a reference. So as you see, when we just print the pointer, the RST int, this is the type RCI32. But printing it like that works fine. Uh, we don't have to do anything like, like we could dereference it and be explicit about it. But uh, in this case, the compiler actually does that operation for us. Um, so essentially dereferencing allows you to convert a box to a T or an RC to a T to just a reference to a T or any other custom type to any T if we implement a dereference trait for it. And the compiler is smart enough to chain these dereferences if it's needed, that's called dereference coercion. So when we have functions, uh, if you remember from earlier, we recommend like, writing functions first, L, whatever. Writing them to take a reference to str, because in that case, we can path both, both string literals and strings to that function. So we could pass, pass both hello, and we could pass goodbye. Both that by adding this little thing. So, because this allows us to go from a string to the to the str. Uh, however, there's another useful thing here as well to know that box str. If we put this string inside of a box, we could also pass the box string in here by taking a reference to that. As this and this is where the chaining happens because now we take a reference to the box string, and doing that gives you a string or a reference to a string, and since it knows that a reference to a string can also be dereferenced into a reference to a str, the compiler sort of adds that extra step for us. So, so uh, we we have that reference. We have a box. Taking a reference to the box gives us that, which then it courses into that. I don't know how many chains uh, it's actually going to do this, uh, but yeah. The, anyway, if you didn't do that, if it, the compiler didn't do this for you, then you would have to manually first dereference it. So you get the string. And then from that dereference, you could take the reference. Uh, and that adds a lot of syntax plot. I think you could write it like this as well. No. So you dereference the box, so you get the string, and then you take the reference to the string uh, to get the string slice. Um, but even this is like a convenient step, so you can technically also dereference uh, the string. Yeah, well, it's, it just gets inconvenient. So it's but it's nice to know that the compiler does this for you. So. So that's nice to know. So that's a part of dereferencing. Um, oops. Uh, additionally, you have uh, the concept of dropping, which basically acts like a destructor within C++. It's a function that gets called when your object that implements this trait goes out of scope. So here it goes 
the RC in three goes out of scope here. And then the drop function gets called, which in this case decreases the reference count. And if it reaches zero, it also frees up the memory and cleans up everything else. Not everything implements drop. Uh, because if you implement drop for something, it disables copy for that type. You cannot copy something that has drop. Uh, that's uh, that's to avoid like you, what you do. Do you do a deep copy? Do you do a shallow copy? Like, yeah, you don't know. Uh, you can do clone, however, which will do uh, the deep copy by default, the or depending on how you implement it. So that's why you have RC clone, which takes care of cloning the relevant things and incrementing the reference count. Uh, if you search up the concept of RAII, which is known as resource acquisition is initialization, uh, you'll be able to read more about the general concept of taking ownership of resources and managing them. Uh, this is a term coined in C++, but drop and DRF basically sort of, it's, it's the same concept. So, and in a way that means that all classes who allocate that allocated resource need to clean up that resource when they go out of scope. So instead of doing it manually, you just create the object and then the object manages the resources and you just use the object. And drop always happens in reverse order of creation. So when we go through the main function here, this is created, this is created, this is created, then this is destroyed. And the weak one is created, this one is created and destroyed here. So when we get to the end of this function, that's when the dropping starts. So we go back up. Box string is the first one to be dropped. Weak gets dropped. This one gets dropped, and this one gets dropped. So it it happens in the reverse order. And that's the exact that's the same way it does in C plus plus two. Um. Yep. And to implement this, you can implement the drop trade for any of your own types. Uh, so if we want to do, try to do this for something, let's say we have a struct that is known as the smartest pointer. And let's make it generic as well, since we wanted to be able to work with anything. Or instead of the smartest, let's actually call it the stack pointer. Uh, it holds some value t which is not public. And then for this trait, let's implement DREF for the stack pointer. Actually, let's and when you dereference it, you get a T out of it. And it's basically self dot value. So now we have a type called the stack pointer, which holds some value T on the stack, at least as long as the struct is created on the stack. If you dereference this, you get a reference to T, which is whatever value you're holding. It makes no sense to implement drop for this, but at least for DRF, we can do it. Uh, so what we can do now is we can say, let SP equals stack pointer, where the value equals, I don't know, 400. Oh, that's private. So we actually have to create, let's just create a quick constructor as well. And then we create a stack pointer value. Like so. So let's create a new one. Then make it public. New. And then put the integer 400 in there. So now we have a stack pointer of i32. We cannot access this value directly. 
And if we try to print it, the stack pointer, uh, we will actually see that it doesn't complain or it does oh, it complains about something else. That's probably not that. Yeah. Yeah, and then it says that this cannot be formatted, but if we try to dereference it, we now are able to get the value of the stack pointer by dereferencing the pointer. So we get 400 as the value. So that's how the deref works. By adding this, it allows you to dereference something that manages something else uh, and get a reference to it. So like if you created an actual smart pointer of some sort, this value would probably be somewhere on the heap and maybe do some other fancy thing like reference counting. And then when you deref it, you would get that value. Right now, this value is, I mean, it's on whatever memory space that you created this one on. So if we created the stack pointer inside of a box, then it would no longer be a stack pointer, for example. And now I would have to, yeah, and now it needs, now we have that nice double star to get the box and then the stack pointer and then the integer, so. Uh, so that's how the DRF works. And we can, I guess we can implement drop for it as well, but without doing anything. And then if we implement that, we can just have a print line to show, make uh, I was dropped TSP. And then And then if we run it now, we will see that the stack pointer at 400, and then we see that it's dropped. And this is called automatically because we get to the end of the function, starts going back up. This is dropped. The box is dropped, and then it drops the stack pointer inside of it. And then we call the drop. So now this drop doesn't actually implement anything. It just prints when it was dropped. So this can be nice if you want to just debug when things get dropped. You can also print that in there. But the memory is freed, right? So there is a default behavior which actually frees all the memory. Yeah, I suppose since this is on the stack in a way, so yeah. it's automatically cleaned up. Uh, but I don't think it calls drop for anything that's not, uh, doesn't implement it. But then it's, if it doesn't implement it, then everything is by default uh, very simple to clean up. So just like undoing the stack pointer or something. Okay, yeah. So you only need to implement drop for anything that can leak in theory. Since the box takes care of actually cleaning up this type, and since that type has just a value T, which is not some other dynamically allocated value, whenever this type is destroyed, then this sort of comes with it because it's just, it's just like it's a stack value. <laughs> in a way, but it doesn't have to be because yeah, of yeah. its part. Yeah, it's a bit confusing stuff. So, so for the stack pointer, the, the default drop, if there was one, it would be doing anything anyway, right? Because- Yeah, it would do basically nothing. It would just move the stack pointer back up if it was on the stack. Yeah, but can you can you overwrite the box drop? Um, I don't think you can, the box will just, the box drop will just unallocate and free the memory that it manages. Yeah. But if it points to something, if it points to a vector, for example, that has its own dynamic memory, then it will call the drop method of the vector and make sure the vector cleans up after itself as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah. Uh, finally, some thinking points. Um, do you need a container to be heterogeneous, as in that it can have uh, type, different types using the, the dynamic uh, dispatch that we talked about? Uh, sometimes if you just have the concept of something, for example, being, well, sometimes maybe two containers better if you just have two different types, 
and you just need to store those. Maybe there's no point in having a heterogeneous container because you can just create two vectors instead, one with the one type and one with the other, and then iterate the two of them. Um, am I coding in Java or not? That's just uh, like, because everything in Java is interfaces and everything is, <laughs> no, it's just a joke. Um, but yeah, you, you do you really need it to be that way? Uh, second, with a smart pointer, are you solving a problem or circumventing a compiler error? For example, do you have some ownership rules or borrow checker rules that you can't figure out and you just decide to throw a reference count on everything? And then you don't get those issues because it's reference counted instead of having a single owner? That's not a good way to go about it. So think about like what are you actually trying to like, what problem are you trying to solve? And also like does the data need to be on the heap? Like because so far in Rust, we haven't really discussed the heap that much. And you can get pretty far without using it at all. Like it's a, it's a strong tool, but uh, you can get really far without it. So do you really need to put it there just because you know how to do it now? Uh, you don't necessarily have to do it. Uh, so yeah, think about what you're doing before you apply a quote solution to it. And as I just said, you can do a lot of things, even if you don't have access to smart pointers and heap memory. Like, of course, you use a vector and you use a string, and they in it, like they use they solve real problems and they they are they work on the heap, but you don't actually interface with that. But that's the same way as when you use a box, you kind of use on a string. They are both in a way smart pointers that we discussed very early in this today. Uh, but the string and the vector, they solve like genuine good problems that you will probably do use actually every day. So, But when you do and work on lower level concepts, such as the box and the reference count, then that's when you need to think a little bit more about what you are trying to achieve. And I think that's about it. So unless we have any fancy questions or questions at all, both to me or Marius about anything. I think that's a good amount of information for today. Yeah, that's quite dense. Um, but if you're coming from C++, most of it should be quite familiar uh, with smart pointers and so on. So mm -hmm. it's quite similar. Um, yeah, just one comment about traits and self. Uh, in Haskell, you can return <laughs> self. So Haskell is a little bit more powerful in the type system, but uh, of course, for the cost of this uh, this intermediation, like uh, Rust makes things more compile time checked and compile time bounded, um, such that it performs you know faster. Uh, Haskell is a bit more dynamic in in, a, in the type system, so you can have certain things that um, are less restrictive. So the the first limitation about traits. Uh, Carl pointed out is not in Haskell, but the second one, I didn't check. I actually think it's the same because the type system would blow up if you have those uh, yeah, nested, uh, you know, <laughs> nested types, which actually have nested types and so on. Like you can't unfold this infinitely. <laughs> so you, and, and also you may have circular dependencies. So I'm pretty positive that it's not possible in Haskell that the default Haskell, but there are some compiler, um, flags that you can use, which you can use uh, for playing with the type system. And I think that might be possible. Uh, and then the compiler will kind of uh, pick something arbitrary uh, to kind of stop the infinite recursion. So I, I don't know. I haven't played with that. So the second one is probably not working by default in, in Haskell neither. Um, yeah. And then about the dynamic dispatch. So that that is a very good, um, uh, that's a very good point. And it that like you know some things in C and Rust are compile time. So some of the like uh, wiring up can happen at compile time. But if some of the types are instantiated at runtime, then you can't wire up the method calls uh, at compile time, and you have to do this dynamic dispatch. And this dynamic dispatch, for example, in Java happens like everywhere. <laughs> there is no <laughs> hardwired dispatch. It's only dynamic dispatch, right? Uh, same with some dynamic languages like Python and, and so on. So that is like the default um, call, you know, uh, case. Uh, in Rust and in C++, you have extra thing. Like you have this ability to hardwire calls 
uh, at compile time such that they happen very efficiently. Uh, so as Carl was pointing out, you have to trade off the flexibility of the language, like you know Java or Haskell, they have a lot of flexibility, but they sacrifice it by performance. You have those uh, the uh, you have to do those multiple steps of getting to the actual code which needs to be needs to run. Uh, in Rust and in C++, you can kind of um, code in such a way that this is done by the compiler itself. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you want the flexibility, like sometimes you want to be able to deal with multiple types. And I, I really like this uh, suggestion card make that sometimes you have a container which you need like two or three types of things to be stored and you do need to pay this price of uh, dynamic dispatch. But if you store that instead in three containers that you can get all the you know, performance with, without sacrificing it. So, so sometimes it's up to you, like uh, what, re what is that you're really solving? So I, I kind of liked uh, Carl point there. Yeah, I don't have any extra thoughts. If you have any problems, like uh, if you get stuck or if you don't quite understand th those concepts, then like, yeah, uh, tell me or tell Carl. And those are quite important for uh, statically typed languages. Of course, like in Java or in Python or in Haskell, you don't deal with this almost at all. You don't even think about it uh, because everything is done dynamically. Uh, but here, yeah, you're in charge. You're in charge. So you can kind of um, uh, make decisions yourself. And as we've seen with the student's example, if you do too much with managed pointers, then you pay the performance price, right? So the default implementation in C++ was actually quite slow uh, because, um, it, you know, you pay the price and you pay the price in Rust or you pay the price in C++ as well. It's not like those languages come with the performance for free, um, but you have the ability to squeeze more performance if you if you need to. Whereas in Haskell or 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 Rust um, or Python, you can't really do that. Like you are at the mercy of the dynamic system. So, yeah, that's just my comments. Any questions, guys? Yeah, if no questions, I will stop the stop the recording.